morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope you all had your kofefe and everything to caffeinate you or get you through till the big Chick-fil-A comes. So this is not meant to be a very technical talk. I want to give a more broad approach that you can take your both offensive and defensive mindsets in order to take abstract concepts and tie them in together because I'm pretty sure almost everyone in this room is IT information security or some variant of it. So quick first show of hands. The Star Trek fans, raise your hands. The Star Wars fans, raise your hands. And neither of those fans, raise your hands. Why, and here's my first question, why? Anyone, anyone care to volunteer why? Neither of those two? <laughs> now, what if you can tie those two irrelevant things to information security? That's, I submit that to you. Something to dwell on throughout the presentation. <laughs> so the first, who I am. So my name is Tigran. I'm a senior analyst with Accenture Federal Services. I'm one of their cyber threat hunters. Prior to joining Accenture, I worked in the SOC. I did the FISMA, FedRAMP, DIACAP, audits, and I felt a little bit of my soul died as I did a little bit, so I had to escape for the most part. I wasn't originally IT like many people in this room. I was international relations with the folks in world politics and diplomacy, and I made the jump through there. So it's a very atypical journey, but it did give me some good insight. So the classic disclaimers, these are my own opinions, and they do not reflect that of Accenture Federal. I also may be slightly biased because I grew up exposed in a multicultural environment and I've traveled extensively with family and I just had a habitual curiosity of everything, even the boring things, even the way to turn the boring things into something that was more fascinating for me. So first we're going to start by defining what is the rena a renaissance approach. Well, a renaissance man or woman is a person who is well educated and sophisticated and who has the talent and knowledge in a variety of fields be it they related or not related. One great two great examples would be Leonardo da Vinci, as he was a scientist, an artist, a musician, inventor, and writer, and Marie Curie, who was, a phys uh, correct me if I'm wrong, a physicist and a chemist, and was able to use both interchangeably. A quote I found that's very, very helpful in this field is that one should try to embrace all knowledge and develop their own capacities as much as they can. Doesn't necessarily have to be expert, per se, but a deep enough understanding that you can cross-correlate with other topics. Who remembers this show of hands from high school or college? The dreaded Persia that our teachers would hammer into our minds. Politics, economics, religion, social, intellectual, area or artistic, and N is the volunteer one for geography. Each one of these we were told for our AP exams to focus on them because they will be tested on them. But I found that applying Persia to other outside academic pursuits was very helpful, especially in this field. Who knows this guy? Raise of hands. And why is he formidable? He was formidable because he understood their enemies enemies specifically, so did their philosophy and the way he learned everything about them to know about. You just have to Great. And how can you correlate this in information security? Anyone? If you know anything about uh, a target, you can uh, use that uh, to, to social engineer or uh, get, get some kind of results. Exactly. And Thrawn's, and one of the greatest things about Thrawn is that he emulated this philosophy that I felt like that a lot of our red teams should look at. Because in essence, it's not just the tools, because we're so tool-centric at times, we forget that there's a whole other mindset that comes with the red team. Duty. We have to become the bad guy. No, we, don't have, we cannot follow the rules, or else it defeats the purpose of red teaming. And his counterpart from Star Trek. He's knowledgeable in a variety archaeology, music, philosophy, tea, history, and tactics, and throughout all of the fandom of the next generation, we've seen him use these variety of disciplines to help knowledge to navigate through dip difficult circumstances, diplomatic or volatile. 
So this is Orit Gadiesh, the chairman of Bain and Company, who coined up the term expert generalist. I feel that the expert generalist is the end-all product of following what I call the Renaissance approach. And Orit defines the expert generalist as someone who has the ability as well as the curiosity to master and collect expertise in a variety of disciplines. They not necessarily have to be connected in industries, skills, capabilities, countries, and topics. And what this does, it allows you to draw deep on that palette of knowledge and create points that you can take and then infuse that into a centered topic of choice. In this case, information security. We can take things from English, psychology, chemistry, physics, the entire spectrum of subjects and then help use that mindset in our own when dealing with attackers or defense. Another thing it does, allows us to do is to drill deep and perfect our thinking in information security. This concept is commonly known as the T-shaped individual, which I'll get into a little bit later. These are some uh, famous expert generalists who applied the Renaissance approach throughout their careers. Throughout history, as you see, Warren Buffett, Kathy Calvin, Da Vinci, Thurin, Isaac Newton, or Gadiesh. There are some others, like Ellen DeGeneres, Oprah Winfrey. A lot of the celebrities were able to do very similar things, as you can see in the success of their branding and marketing, in addition to what they were primarily known for. Who knows Charlie Munger? Show of hands. Who is he, sir? Okay, and you notice how he's not talked about much. It's always the focus is on Warren Buffett, but he embodies the quintessential expert generalist. He studied, in addition to his primary focus of investing, he studied psychology, chemistry, physics, English, law, microeconomics, and he tied them all together to generate models for approach, for approaching different problems. And I feel that in the same way, this two-track analysis can be used to in information security because it allows you to see the world a little more accurate and make better predictions of the future because you're not as susceptible to the biases of one area of focus as someone would be who's spent their entire focus in one track for all their life. Another thing is will allow you to do is potentially have more breakthrough ideas because you pull insights that already work in one area into another that may or may not work yet. A third thing it does is that it helps you build deeper connections with people because some cultures hold different values closer to their heart as opposed to others. And being able to be cognizant and understanding of that allows you to garner more respect as well as intimacy. Because if you meet someone, for example, and you have one thing in common, okay, that, that's great, but that's not enough to establish more trust and friendliness with them. Now, if there are three or four things you have in common, albeit they may not just be tied in with information security, but let's say you like both like coffee, tea, or shrubberies, gardening, or the knights who say neat. Okay, they get me. That's the first thing they get, and they would be automatically accepted into the tribe, whatever it may be. So this is the T-shaped the individual that Orit Gadiesh and Charlie Munger and body very well. The main stack would be in the middle of the T, I would put information security, and below it, I would start putting in the palettes of what you learn from different subjects, however boring they may be, there, and then use it to feed information security. So in a way, you use all arbitrary and random tidbits of data, but reinforce it, your role as a security analyst. Some of the benefits. As Sun Tzu said, it gives you more options to bluff. And the ability, as mentioned before, the ability to understand both cultures garners a deeper respect from a target towards a social engineer. I actually picked that up last year when I was at DEF CON 24. There was a Japanese national, Tomohisa Ishikawa. He was giving a, a presentation on the cultural impacts of social engineering. And that's one of the biggest insights I drew from his presentation. Who's, who's familiar with the, the AMRO bank heist? 
in 2007. Anyone? Okay, so what happened was in 2007, a mystery man burgled safe depo safety deposit boxes at the Amro Bank in Belgium. He stole diamonds and other gems weighing at 120,000 carats in all. He visited the bank during his normal hours and overcame all of the security mechanisms and walked right out of the door with about 21 million, now 27.9 million, with no tech, tech vector at all. There were no hacks, there were no flaws, but he used charm and the Renaissance approach. He got to know everyone. He was very well educated. He spoke multiple languages. He brought chocolates for the employees and, get, and garnered so much trust that the employees gave him the keys to the safety deposit boxes. Like let's say they had to go to the bathroom or they had to run an emergency errand for their family. He gave them the keys. So he made copies of them and used that to pull off his heist. This should give a better uh, indication of how you can use these random subjects if you're doing a social engineering engagement. If, one, if the more limited your pie is, the less chances that your social engineering engagement will work. Or it also, in converse, it's less likely that someone will be able to exploit you. Because if you have a deeper knowledge in a variety of topics, and you know someone's full of it, you can call them out on it that way. Or make a mental note saying this person's not being truthful to be able to detect a little bit easier. It's not a foolproof method, but it does increase the percentages. These are just a few examples of the approach. However, wish, however way you want to pair it, it's up to you. Some complement each other, and you can thread different topics with individuals. But just remember, when you connect with someone on multiple levels, it solidifies trust, authenticity, and the emotions that you may have with them because you get them. You're automatically accepted into their tribe because you understand them on a myriad of tiers. These are some recommended readings I have based on Persia. I'll be including this on my GitHub for those that are curious, as well as diving into deeper, smaller subtopics, for example, in information security, as well as social psychology and the like. So this list will be available on my GitHub within the week. Here's some recommended podcasts I have because all I know I know very well that most people, a lot of people, do not like to read and prefer the audiobook version or just listening. And this is for those, the audio files. I highly recommend the Social Engineer podcast and The Art of Charm, as well as the Tim Fenris show. There have been some really good recordings from them. So to make a wrap up, so the Renaissance approach enables you to essentially become a human NMAP or expert generalist. You'll have more to discuss with people, contribute with them. It also eliminates the potential of saying that, oh, they don't know much, they don't know what to talk about. This gives you a myriad of things to talk about with people. And you can also bridge cultural differences, which can be used in your favor if you are on engagements, because other cultures have different values and priorities, as Tomohisa eloquently put it in his presentation. And you can create your pretext on the spot. When you feel like you have nothing to say, you can just draw something random or make an observation and use it that way. Just remember, use it for good, just like the force. And getting in touch, this is my Twitter, GitHub, and email. Does anyone have any questions, per se? I want to make this as engaging as possible because you might, you might be wondering why the arbitrariness of it all, and I would love to help put it in perspective for you. Yes, ma'am. I am wondering, your presentation is very general. Do you have a specific example where someone knowing how to talk about all different things helped in the information security industry? OK, certainly. So one example would be, would be the, the Russian hack, the, the democratic breach, for example. It was determined that they were done by two threat actor groups from Russia. But based on that, let's look at the cultural aspects of Russians. Throughout their history, they've been very persistent. They've been almost merciless to the point that they don't take no for an answer. They also like to 
leave artifacts behind, but in the mindset that they wanted you to find that. So just like the Russian nesting dolls, the matryoshkas, they leave you artifacts, but that's because they wanted you to find it as well. Does that help see how you can tie in certain aspects of their cultural as well as the information security, ma'am? Okay, so let's look through their other aspects. The cultural aspects help define an upbringing, help define how people usually act. An example would be the person who created the uh, black POS from the Target breach and the Neiman Marcus breach. The 13-year-old coder, raised in Russia, he made this exploit, sold on the black market, and the actual people who pulled off the heist bought it. But those pe the people in Russia grow up in a very, very mathematics, chess-influenced, it's just a very, very inter interlocked on the cultural approach. They learn their culture, and then they learn about other cultures. And that allows them to have edges on others that, let's say, are more tool-centric as opposed to culturally-centric because they anticipate what the next step is gonna be. They're already able to predict. Let's say this culture is a stickler for rules. We follow the book and go this way. The Russians exploit that in that case. Does that help further answer your question, ma'am? You have examples besides Russia? China would be another one. Oh, Non-state actor. Non-state actor? It'd be a little difficult for me to pull out a non-state actor example. Per se, I don't have one readily, but I am planning on getting a little more in-depth and more specifics in my follow-up talk. I meant this to be as general as possible. The next of the series is gonna be more specific, going to more of the case studies. So I could not answer your question. Either. Yes, sir? Your previous slide was, I think that was international finance, international politics. International relations, world politics, and diplomacy. So, somebody really interested in want to understand Russian sensibilities, cultural sensibilities, right? So if you're going to go from PGO to business, it's important you understand what it makes a Russian and Russian. Where do you even, like, where do you start? Like, where do you start? If you want to, like, you just mentioned this Russian example, right? Mm -hmm. the, the Russian doll. So the Russian uh, wanting you to find something. Like, if I want to understand the sensibilities of an individual, not, I don't want to say typical Russian, but the Russian mindset, where do you, like, how do you begin to attack that problem? That's an excellent question. I'm glad you brought that up. So the Defense Language Institute has a certain section that's open to the public. It's called, it's a specific country in perspective. They have something called Russia in perspective, and they touch on a lot of the things I discussed on the cultural aspects, the geographic. Basically, they go down through Persia in a very, very detailed way. And for a jump start, let's say you haven't learned the language at all, it would be a great first resource. I, I, I went through, I'm sorry? It's free and open. It's free and open. I'll provide the link on my GitHub. Anyone else? I do have some prizes for you guys. So, we'll start with the rubber ducky. Anyone can answer, who is the guy from Star Wars I made reference to? You got it. Come on over here. Thank you. Not a problem. The package deal here, we've got a uh, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz dual band high gain indoor panel antenna and a long range USB adapter. This is the question for you guys. Who is the guy that's not, I mentioned, that is not well referenced, per se, it, all the attention is on his partner, but he's seldom talked about? Charlie Munger. You got it. And the last one. For further, for white hair and graying at an early age, the Blue Team Handbook, Instant Response Edition. This question would be, if someone can explain to me the T-shaped the individual, the diagram. You got it.
And for people with questionable intent, a lockpick set. <laughs> illegal in the state of Virginia. Illegal, exactly, illegal in the state of Virginia. Just make a letter saying, I'm authorized, or something along those lines before you wander around with this. But what was the term I used to determine how the Russians had hid their artifacts through the Democratic, for the Demo DNC breach? You got it. 